Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Bennett, and it's great to see you all. I'm the Executive Director of Academics here at Karis Bible College. And uh, this is Thursday evening. Uh, we're about to have a Good Friday and Easter weekend. And I uh, pray that you have a, an amazing weekend. And so today what I want to share with you all about is how to pray for others. And first, though, a couple reminders. Uh, if you're watching live, this is interactive. And so you can leave comments uh, in the comment section or um, well, however you're watching, if there's a comment way. I, I can't remember if there's other ways other than just the comment section. Um, also, if at any time you need prayer or you'd like to um, donate or ask for resources, anything like that, become a partner with us. You can call 719-635-1111 and get in touch with our, our helpline, or you can go to our website, awmi.net. We have a lot of extra resources there also. And also, I'll just mention Campus Days is up next week. It's coming up next week from Wednesday through Friday, April 3rd through the 5th. And I'm very excited about that. I encourage you to um, either tune in or come in person if you're, pos if you're able to, if it's possible. And I also encourage, you know, bring friends, bring family, um, bring your, your teenagers uh, if you're able to. Because even if it's not somebody who's um, considering coming to Karis immediately, uh, typically, it's messages about your future, about hearing God, about next steps in life, about your long-term vision and calling and things like that. And so um, it should be great. We also have the David musical coming up. I'm really excited to see that. Uh, that'll be this weekend, so starting tomorrow night. And then a lot, a lot of neat things happening here, so we're very excited. And uh, anyway, well, it's good to see you all. I feel like it's been a little while. I can't remember. I'm, I'm hosting myself again. And so uh, I'll be doing the Q&A at the end, and we'll see how that goes. It's a, a bit... Um, uh, anyway, since I don't have somebody to help me choose questions, I just have to choose them live. Then you never know what's going to happen. So anyway, uh, I want to talk about how to pray for others. And then specifically in the second half, I want to talk about uh, four different types of people that I recommend praying for. So we'll get to that in the second half. But basically, though, there, there's some people it's obvious to pray for. You know, some people like your family, uh, friends, people who are going through something, it's obvious to pray for them. But there's there's four specific types of people, uh, categories of people that aren't as obvious that I want to talk about. But first, I want to talk about praying for people in general. And in uh, here at Karis in first year, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a whole course on this for eight hours and it kind of combines with another course. So about 16 hours um, on praying for um, praying in general. So I can't go that in depth right now in 30 minutes, but um, I want to cover a few things real quick, a few of the general principles, even though I can't cover everything. Uh, I want to cover some of the major things. And now this course that I teach in first year is called New Covenant Prayer. And the reason why I call it New Covenant Prayer is because the way we pray should reflect the covenant that we're in, right? We're in the New Covenant, so prayer should look different than people who had no covenant, people who were in the Old Covenant, because the covenant really is our reality. It, it's... Um, it's the, the uh, it's the promises and the commitments that God's made with us and the things he's provided for us and um, what our access is to him. And so the way we pray should reflect the covenant that we're in. So, you know, we shouldn't pray like Job, right? He had no covenant with God. And so we shouldn't pray just like him. We shouldn't pray just like David. You know, he was in the old covenant. So even though we might learn principles from them that might still apply for today, we should pray in a way that reflects what Jesus did, what he accomplished, right? Like I said, we're, we're approaching Easter weekend and the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus completely changes how we should pray. There's certain things that aren't true anymore uh, that were true in the Old Testament or, or different parts of the Bible. There are things that are true now based on what Jesus accomplished. And so the way we pray should reflect our reality, which is based off of what Jesus has accomplished, right? Some people will say things like, rend the heavens, Lord, and come down. He already did. He rent the heavens and he came down. So we don't need to pray like that. We don't need to pray like he's really far away and we need someone to wage warfare for our prayers to get to God. No, he's inside us. He's within us. And so we don't need to pray like that. Same as, a, you know, another example, D uh, David in Psalms would say, take not your Holy Spirit away from me. We don't need to pray like that. We're in the new covenant. He's not going to ever depart us. He's not going to forsake us. So we don't have to be concerned because see, David had the Holy Spirit come upon him and would sometimes leave. And he's saying, don't take your spirit away from me. But we're, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit's never going to leave us. And so 
uh, you can go a lot more in depth on this, but basically we're in a very different situation. We can still learn some valuable principles from the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and people before a covenant, but the way we pray should reflect what Jesus accomplished, which hadn't been accomplished back in the days of Job, Abraham, Daniel, Joseph, Esther, all these different people. So, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> excuse me, intercessors, they would go to God on behalf of other people. So that's a big difference that you'll see between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, is that in the Old Covenant you'd see examples of people going to God and saying, God, I'm, I'm here on behalf of them. I'm here on behalf of this person or this nation or this city, and please forgive them, right? You, had, you might have somebody saying, have mercy on them, Lord. Or I repent on behalf of my nation. I repent on behalf of this city, things like that. That's how intercession worked before, is they were there representing other people when they talked to God. That's obsolete now. That's not how the new covenant works. Now we don't need to go to God and say, I'm here to be their mediator. I'm here to represent them to you. Please have mercy on them. That, we don't need to do that because we already have a better mediator. We have a better intercessor on our behalf. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter two, verse five says, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus, or the man, Christ Jesus. Right, so there's one mediator between us and the Father. We don't need to step in between God and other people and say, have mercy on them, because he's already shown mercy. Jesus is, this, is the ultimate sacrifice. He stands between us and the Father, and he says, they're like me. You know, they're new creations, they're in me. And so he's, we don't need that anymore. So now, instead of us praying for others and saying, God, forgive them, I'm standing on behalf of them, please don't punish them. No, he already punished Jesus on their behalf. And so everything's different. We have a we have a perfect mediator now. We don't need to take on that role for other people. That's not what New Testament, New Covenant intercession is. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 20 says, now then we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, All right? So we're ambassadors for Christ. See that, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who represents their king represents a nation on behalf of their king, on behalf of their president, whatever it may be. So it's saying we're his ambassador. So instead of saying, I'm here to represent my people to God, it's actually the opposite now. Now I'm saying, God, I'm your ambassador. How do you want me to represent you in this situation? Right, see now in the new covenant, when we pray for others, we don't say, God, please do this, please do that, please do that, please don't do this, please don't do that, and mediating for them we're saying, Father, you love them more than I do. You've already paid the price through Jesus for their healing, for their salvation, all these different things. So now I'm representing Christ to them. I go to God and say, how do you want me to represent you in this situation? What do you want me to pray over them? What do you want me to speak over them? What do you want me to do, you want me to, do anything? Do you want me to command me to go do something to go bless these people like Ananias um, when he was praying and, and God told him to go meet Paul? And so... <clears throat> We're ambassadors for Christ, that completely changes how we intercede for people, right? When we're interceding for others, we don't have to go to God and say, God, please don't pour out your wrath on them. I apologize on their behalf. That's, that's old covenant. That's, you know, pre-covenant. In the new covenant, we're saying, God, you've already done everything. How do you want me to represent you? How can I show your love to these people? How can I help them receive what you've already done? How can I play a part in your love flowing through me to these people? So again, he's saying here, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, right? God's already paid for reconciliation. So they're saying as, as God's ambassadors, we're saying, please reconcile yourself to God, right? Receive his forgiveness, receive the promises that he's provided for us. So old covenant is, God, is saying, I'm here to represent them. New covenant is God, I'm here to represent you. How can I be your hands and feet in this world to represent you and what you've done and what Jesus has already accomplished? So that changes everything. I'll give a couple examples of this. Um, that are pretty good because sometimes we wonder, how should I pray for other people in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, as a New Covenant believer? So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. This is a prayer of Paul for the Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Right? So this is Paul praying for them, and now we get to see a glimpse of how Paul prayed for others. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So he's asking for him to give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Open their eyes to what you've already done. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. So how's He praying for this church? He's saying, I pray that God open your eyes to see how, how good He is toward you, how much He loves you, the power He has toward you, the thing He's done, right? The, the riches of His inheritance. So He's not saying, I pray that God do these things for you. He's saying, I pray that you, your eyes open to see what He's already done. So completely, that's not how people prayed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if, if someone said, God, open their eyes to see themselves the way that you see them, they'd look at themselves and say, I deserve to die, I'm unholy. See, in the Old Covenant, it wasn't just open their eyes to see what you've done. It's, it was, you know, forgive them, have mercy on them, things like that. And the New Covenant, it's open up their eyes so they can see what you've already done. Like, you know, if you want to go more in depth on that, you can listen to Andrew's series on a better way to pray and you've already got it. It's, he's already done these things. So the prayer is God open their eyes so they see it and believe it and understand how good you are and all these amazing things you've done for them. So that, that's completely different. You know, King David didn't pray like that. Um, Job didn't pray like that. This is how Paul prayed in the New Covenant. Another example <clears throat> is Luke chapter 10, verse, um, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. It says, Then he said to them, this is Jesus talking, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out unto his harvest. So this is a valid way to pray. Just saying, here's a way to, so here's something you should pray is that there's a harvest out there. There's people who, who are ready to receive what God's done for them. But we, God needs people in this world to go and spread the word to them. How can they believe without a preacher? Right? There, we, need to see, we need people who go out and show God's love to others because there's people out there who are ready to receive, ready to be born again, ready to be healed, ready to be set free from lies and bondage and all kinds of things. So he's saying, pray that God will send laborers, send people. You know, God, I, I bless the people, send people, if there's anything I can, I can do to help other people, I pray that they be effective, that they have boldness, that they speak effectively and with power, have favor where they go. And so he's saying, pray for God to send laborers into the harvest. So that's a valid way to pray in the new covenant. So, you know, again, this, you don't have to say it word for word like this. These aren't formula prayers, but we can follow the principles. We're basically it's saying, you know, if there's somebody that, that you care about, you could say, Father, I pray that you send laborers their way. I pray that you send people across their path who know you and love you, who can be witnesses to, to them, who can bless them, who can help speak the right words to them at the right time, who can sow seeds into their heart and, and help draw them back to you or helps, you know, people who, even if they're not walking away from God, if they're, if they're doing well, just for other people to go there, cross their path and bless them and help them grow and know God more and more. Um, and if they're not born again, pray for God to send people across their path who will stir in them a desire to, to know Him more and to, uh, to be born again. So those are two examples of ways that you can pray in the New Covenant. And like I said, this isn't how people prayed in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, people could be forgiven temporarily, but they, it wasn't the same. You couldn't become a new creation until Jesus rose from the dead. So uh, these two examples show that, that Paul was praying for their eyes to be opened for them to see what was already true in the Spirit, and for them to see what God sees, right? Open their eyes to see what you've done. And the second one that we saw here is for God, praying for God to send other believers across their path to bless them, to help them, to help them uh, witness to them, to be blessings to them, things like that. I right? see maybe there's somebody that you care about and you don't have access to them. Right? Maybe there's somebody you care about who's really far away from you right now. And so as much as you'd love to just sow the word into them, be kind to them, be generous to them, bless them, be an inspiration to them, um, be, demonstrate God's love to them. It's like, I don't have access. You know, I, mean, I don't have the kind of time uh, available to me to be a blessing to them. You can pray for God to use other people. Um, or, or it may be somebody you have access to, but they refuse to receive from you. You know, sometimes family is the toughest people to receive from you. You might want to bless people all day long, and they won't receive from you because they know you too well. You even saw this with Jesus, where the people who knew him well rejected him because they're like, we know you, you think you're all that, we know what you're like. So sometimes family or people who are very close to you uh, won't receive from you, even though you get to spend time with them. And so sometimes in situations like that, the best thing is pray for God to send other people their way, right? You just keep being a blessing, loving them, being, being Christ-like, being a light in their life. But you can pray, Father, I pray that you send people across their path that they will receive from. You know, <clears throat> it's amazing. You know, there's something about um, 
people you don't know as well that you might open up your heart to receive from somebody else, you know, a stranger who says something to you might spark something and you might say, I've been saying that to you for 20 years. Why didn't you listen to me? Because maybe they know you so well that they just are immune to what you have to say. But if somebody else says it, they might receive. And you see this kind of stuff happen all the time, right? If you get on the stage and you minister on marriage, somebody might say, well, that's a great point. I, I'm going to change how I treat my spouse. Now, the spouse may say, but I've been telling you this for years. You know, why do you believe them, not me? Because, again, we become immune to the people who we're close to, and sometimes it's easier to receive from somebody else. And so you could pray for them to, you know, them to have the right friends. You could pray for all kinds of things. You know, send the right people their path who can minister to them, strangers, divine encounters, for them to have good friends, for them to have good teachers, whatever the situation may be. So those are two basic examples of, of ways to pray for people in the New Covenant. And so now I want to talk about four different types of people that I encourage you to pray for based on what I've just been sharing. So the first one, like I said, there's obvious ones and these ones may, may, may be obvious to you, but probably aren't as obvious um, all the time. So the first one, number one, is that you can pray for your children's future spouses. Right? Your children's future spouses, as in maybe, maybe they're out there somewhere, right? And if, if um, your kids are older, maybe your grandchildren's future spouses. So <clears throat> what do I mean by this? If you have children or teenagers or kids in their 20s, 30s, whatever age range, their spouse is probably alive somewhere on this earth, right? If you have really, really young children, then maybe, you know, I have a two-year-old, so maybe his future spouse isn't born yet if he marries somebody younger than him, right? So there may be situations like that. But for the most part, if you have children, their spouses are out there somewhere. They might be on the other side of the world. They might, might be down the street. We don't know. You don't have to know exactly who they are to pray for them. Today, you can begin praying for your children's future spouses, the same way that you should be praying for your children, right? It's saying, Father, I pray that their future spouses, um, that they know you, that they be protected, that they have favor, that they grow in wisdom, that the eyes of their understanding open, that they walk in wisdom, that they receive your blessings. I pray for them to have the right friends, for their parents to have wisdom, for them to have the right teachers, the right coaches, all these different things. You know, you can pray blessing over them. You can prophesy over them. You can speak life over them. And so, again, to me, this is great because why wait until you meet someone to start praying for them? You know they're out there somewhere, so just start praying for them now. You know, it's amazing how much simpler life can be if we avoid a lot of baggage. So why not pray for people now instead of, you know, pray for them to avoid the wrong relationships, to not fall in love with the wrong people, to, to have their hearts healed, to be healthy and wise and um, to, to know you and to have a des desire for you and who you are and to uh, make wise choices and... Um, pursue the things that you're calling them to pursue for them to enjoy their calling, right? You can go on and on praying for these people that you haven't met yet, but someday you will. And that makes it a lot more fun too, right? You know, whenever I meet my children's future spouses, which my children are still children, but 20 years from now, when I meet them, I'll be able to say, I've been praying for you your whole life, right? I, I just now met you, but I've been praying for you your whole life and you're blessed, right? And, um, and again, just having that mindset can be a blessing. If they're not born yet, you can still pray for their, their families, their future friends, their future coaches and teachers and Sunday school teachers. And um, just across the board, you can just bless people, even if you don't know who they are, just based on a criteria. Father, you know who they are. I bless them in Jesus' name and, and ask God for how you want him to pray over them. So Proverbs 13, verse 22, Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And so the concept I'm, going, I'm looking at here is that it's a good thing, right? it's a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his grandchildren. It's a good thing to make decisions today that will bless our, um, our, our, um, our children, our grandchildren, next future generations. Right? It's good to live our lives thinking of other people down the road because again, leaving an inheritance for your descendants means that right, I don't have grandchildren right now. But if I'm a good man, I'm already thinking about how to bless those people that don't even exist yet. So same thing should be said for our, um, it's not just about a physical inheritance, it's a spiritual inheritance, it's blessing, it's wisdom, it's favor, all kinds of things we can be praying in advance. Like I said, we can be praying for our own kids, same thing, not just their future spouses, we can also be praying for their friends, their coaches, their teachers, their mentors, their children's pastors, their co-workers in the future, their bosses in the future, their employees in the future. You know, we can be, um, we can be going in advance ahead of them and laying the groundwork of just blessing people and overflowing. So that's number one. Um, 
is praying for our children's future spouses. And really it's praying for our children's future relationships, all of them. But spouses is a really big one. So number two um, is that you can pray for government leaders. Right, 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore I exhort first, first of all, that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be, uh, be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable, um, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So you probably know this already, we should pray for people in government, people who in leadership roles. And it's easy to pray for the ones that we like. But this doesn't say pray for the ones that you like. Pray for all of them, even the ones that you don't like. Now, that does not mean that we have to pray for them to succeed in ungodly goals that they have. But we should still be praying for them, right? You, you see, and it says here that it's so we can have quiet and peaceable lives. See, if they're blessed, it actually is better for us, even if they're ungodly. We want them to have wisdom. We want them to be blessed. We want them to make good decisions. You know, God can still use ungodly people to, to do godly things, things that bless us. And so even if we don't like someone, we should be praying for them. You know, it's, I get it that we need to be vocal about standing up for righteousness and godliness and goodness. But there, there's a line where are we standing up for godliness or have we just become um, cynical and mocking and gossiping and hating on people? You know, we're not called to just constantly be negative and criticize and tear people down. I mean, we're, we should be trying to lift people up. Again, I'm not saying we should support people if they have ungodly goals and agendas, but we can still pray for them as individuals, as people, pray for them to be blessed, to be in health, you know. Um, and it's sometimes we're, uh, we're trying to fight, um, fight, fight other people when that's not what we're called to do. I'll touch on that more here in a little bit. But to give a biblical example, you know, Daniel in the Bible, he was kidnapped as a child, or as a youth, by Nebuchadnezzar, by King Nebuchadnezzar. And most, many people he knew, so he was kidnapped, but then he, the king went back and slaughtered people, destroyed Jerusalem, I mean, massacred people. His, his friends were thrown into the fiery furnace for not bowing down to him, and they survived. You know, that's a different story. But Daniel had every reason to, to not like this guy. And yet you see that Daniel still cared about him and what was best for him, even though this was an ungodly man. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 19 says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, um, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke. So the king called him in to interpret something, and Daniel, when he heard it, he, he knew the interpretation, and it bothered him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered, and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation your, concern your enemies. Right? So Daniel didn't say, you're getting what you deserve. Look what you did to my people. It's, you know, it's your turn. You're going to suffer as much as you've made us suffer. That wasn't Daniel's heart. He genuinely loved him even though he was his enemy. It sounds like something Jesus encouraged us to do or told us to do. It's love your enemies. He's saying, I don't, this, is a, this dream is something bad is going to happen to you and I wish it weren't going to happen. Like he was genuinely sad that something bad was going to happen to this king who Daniel could have seen him as his enemy, but instead he says, I love you even though you're un ungodly and I want good things to happen to you and to the kingdom. And so again, he didn't see this as a chance for revenge. He saw this as genuine. I, I don't want you to have bad things happen to you. Again, just like Jesus, I mean, when he's on the cross, he's, he's praying for forgiveness for others. You know, it's uh, Stephen, when he's being stoned, he's praying forgiveness for those who are killing him. You know, that's truly the heart we should have is that we should love our enemies, realizing that the people aren't our true enemy. They're deceived, our true enemy. It's, it's a spiritual thing. Now, later on, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he uh, believed in God, and he actually wrote one of the chapters of the Bible. And so, uh, you know, he may very well be in heaven right now. Even though he was a very ungodly person, he, he, he you know, he, by Daniel's witness and the witness of others, uh, he came around to believing in, in the true God. So we, we should pray for leaders even if we don't like them, but it doesn't mean we pray for them to be successful in ungodly ambitions, but we can still pray for wisdom. We can pray for their hearts to be changed. We can pray for them to be blessed. Um, things like that, right? It's the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Why can't, we can pray God's goodness over people even if um, they're our enemies. So. Um, number three, number two is we can pray for political leaders, even if we don't like them. Number three is that we can pray for our enemies. Very similar to what I was just touching on. Matthew 5, verse 44, Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, 
Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, right? Persecute you. Even those who are trying to harm you, you can pray for them. You can love your enemies. This isn't just, um, this isn't just the emotion, but it's, it's the actions of loving people. And that, now this does not mean, we have to balance these things out with the context. This does not mean to be a pushover, right? Oh, my enemies want to harm me and want to steal from me, want to take from me. I'm just going to let them. No, it says if you're being persecuted, you should run away, right? Don't, don't make it easy for people to harm you. If they're trying to harm you, then, then try to prevent that. So it doesn't mean be a pushover, be a doormat, or just tell people what they want to hear. Like, oh, I don't want to offend you, so I'll just adjust the truth to not offend you. No, this is balanced with boldness. We should be incredibly bold about the truth. We shouldn't back down on the truth, and that's what causes persecution. But in spite of that, we should love the people persecuting us. We should, we should care about them. We should... Um, we should do good to them and do good to those who hate you, right? So it's not just talking about um, uh, get revenge, get payback, things like that. No, we can love them. It doesn't mean that we back down. It doesn't mean that we, we just roll over and let them say whatever they want to say. It, it's No, it's just the opposite. We, lo- we have enemies because we stand up for the truth. If we don't have enemies, then something's wrong because it means we, we stand for nothing. We should be standing for the truth that will lead to enemies, but we love them anyway. See, people are never our real enemy. Now, people can align themselves with the enemy, and they can choose and commit themselves to being completely um, allied with darkness. I get that. But ultimately, our true enemy is beyond people who are deceived and lost. Right? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Um, Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Right? See, that doesn't mean that we have to go get in an airplane or stand on a mountaintop to do spiritual warfare. That's not what this is talking about. See, the battle is in the minds and hearts of people. The way that we do true spiritual warfare isn't by trying to directly fight demons. We see no examples of that in Scripture. Um, True spiritual warfare is speaking the truth to people. And so the way that darkness wins is lies take over people's hearts and minds. The way that light wins is that light and truth take over people's hearts and minds. So the battle is in the minds of people. So the way we do spiritual warfare is by speaking the truth to people, by being light, by overflowing with God's love to people. That's the battleground is people's hearts and minds. So we don't need to fight the demon. We need to to win in the minds of people. You speak the truth to win the fight. You don't just wrestle with demons. the enemy speaks lies, we speak truth. The battle is in people's minds, is which one will they believe? Which one will they, will they give themselves to? So you never see the apostles pray, God, give me more power to fight demons. You never see that. That's just not how spiritual warfare works. What, they, what you do see is they say, give me more boldness to speak your word. Because that's how you actually do spiritual warfare, is you don't have to worry about the demon. You focus on speaking the truth to people. And that's how we win. That's how we spread God's light and his goodness. Um, yeah, so you never see an example of someone saying, if I could defeat the darkness first, then people will believe. No, it's if they believe, I've defeated the darkness. It's all about people's, um, people's hearts and minds. So Ephesians 4, verses 18 through 20, and this is in the context of spiritual warfare. Um, Ephesians 4, verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me... That utterance may be given to me that I might open my mouth boldly. So he's not asking for supernatural power. He's saying in verse 19, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So again, in here you see Paul praying not for the demons to go away. He's praying for boldness to speak God's word. So that's the key here. That's how Paul did spiritual warfare was boldness to speak God's word, speak God's truth to people by saying that utterance may be given to me. May, you know, I pray for the right words to say, to be able to say the right words, the right time for me to be, have the right words come to mind and to my remembrance. And so you see him, he's asking for the right words to speak. And uh, Acts verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 29, skipping ahead a little bit, says, Now, Lord, Look on their threats. Sorry, this isn't Ephesians. This is Acts. So Acts 4, verse 29. Um, This is after they got persecuted. They said, Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. So same thing. They're getting persecuted. They didn't ask for more power to fight darkness um, in the sense that most people think of it. They did ask for it in a sense because they said, Give us boldness to speak your word. 
And they also said, and may si and, and signs and wonders to follow for people to be healed and miracles to be done to confirm your word. But that's how we fight. That's how we win. That's how we fight darkness is by speaking the truth with boldness, um, not by trying to debate a demon. That has no, there's no, none of that. So um, we can love our enemies. The key is to speak the truth in love, to speak with boldness. And, uh, and that's what that drives out darkness. And so the fourth category here, and I'll cover this one quickly so we can get to some Q&A. Um, but you can pray for people that you're going to meet today. So this is very similar to what I was saying at the beginning about praying for your children's future spouses, is that you can pray for people you're going to meet today. You don't know who you're going to meet today uh, or tomorrow if it's already nighttime, but God knows. He knows who you might meet. See, the, in the same way that we pray for laborers for other people, right? Father, I pray for the people who are going to bless my family, bless, uh, bless my friends, um, you know, that I'll cross paths with. We can be those laborers for someone else. I right? see in the same way I need... I need other believers to bless people I'm praying for. They might be praying for someone that I'll meet tomorrow. And so I can be the laborer for someone else. And so we can pray in advance at the, in the morning and say, Father, whoever I meet today, I ask you to, to get my attention when it's the right people that I should connect with, that I should bless, that I should speak to. You know, you know I ask for divine encounters for you to cross my path with the right people today. And now we're joining in where maybe someone on the other side of the world is praying for that person. And I don't know it. But you know what, like say for example, um, maybe someone has a grandchild they've been praying for for 30 years and they won't receive from that person and this person's just been praying faithfully for God to send laborers their way and maybe I'll cross paths with that person today. So I can pray also and say, Father, cross my path with people, give me the right words to say, I want to join in, right? So to me, I love how we can be on both sides of this. I can pray for God to send people across other people's path and other people are praying for me to cross someone's path. Maybe you're watching this right now and it's because someone else is praying for you to cross paths with someone and now I get to speak some truth into your life, right? It, it's just across the board, we're a body of believers and so we can all play part in blessing others around us. And so um, we're praying for God to send laborers, but we're also laborers ourselves. So we're saying, God, send me on a mission. Who can I bless today? Who's somebody that I could reach today if I, if I go to the right place at the right time, say the right things? So um, that's pretty much it. But having that, that desire in our hearts is, Lord, who can I bless today? You know, go before me, pave the way, create the right opportunity. I pr uh, you know, pray for you to prepare people's hearts in advance so that when I cross paths with them that I can have an opportunity to bless them and things like that. And so, again, the basics, though, are in the New Covenant, or to quickly summarize, in the New Covenant, we should pray differently, should reflect what Jesus accomplished. And based on that, then we can, we can be more creative. We can say, I'm not just going to pray for my kids. I want to pray for their spouses even before I meet them. I'm going to pray for people I'm going to meet before I meet them. I'm going to pray for my enemies. I'm going to pray for people in government. I'm going to pray for all kinds of people. Um, and, and, pray, and the way God answers most prayers is by sending laborers there to, to uh, cooperate, to go share things, to bless people, to say the right things. Because the way that we fight spiritual warfare is by speaking the truth with boldness to people because the battle is in people's hearts and minds. So hope this is helpful. I see we have some questions here, so I'll go ahead and jump into the Q&A with the last, uh, I think we have about 12 minutes. So um, Jocelyn on YouTube is asking, can I still repent on my husband's behalf since we two are one? It's a good question. So ultimately, so there's a scripture that says that, you know, we are one, therefore, and otherwise our children wouldn't be sanctified, but they are. And so I don't fully understand all the levels that works at, but what I do understand is that each individual has to be born again. And so depending what you mean by repenting on someone's behalf, now as far as you being one and reaping what you sow together, things like that, I do believe that there's a place where if one, if one spouse is sowing bad things and one spouse is sowing good things, that they can pray for the harvest to be what they're sowing and not what the other spouse is sowing. So I pray for us to be redeemed from negative you know, things that they're sowing um, because we're one. Now, as far as their own walk with God, if they don't personally receive Jesus, we can't repent on someone else's behalf. We can't get born again for somebody else. You know, so same thing, we, you know, we can't get born again on behalf of our children, on behalf of our spouse, things like that. So if that's what we mean by repentance, we can't do that on behalf of someone else. We can still pray for them. But as far as us functioning as a family unit, then yes, I believe that we can, if one person is wholly redeemed and has God's blessing on their life, that can overrule some of the curses that the other person might be bringing into the family and say, no, because I'm blessed, we're blessed. 
right? It's kind of like the Ark of the Covenant. When it went into someone's home, the whole home was blessed. The children prospered, the whole, the, everybody in the household prospered because the, God's presence was in that home. In a similar way, if one spouse has, has the Spirit of God inside of them, then that can bring blessing unto the whole home and household, even if not everyone in the household is saved and born again. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, let's see, let's see. Um, let's see, so Denise on YouTube, does God sometimes reveal who our children's future spouses are, especially if they have been praying for a future spouse and seeking the Lord about it? Um, let's see, I think I'm understanding that correctly. So, so uh, um, yeah, oh, okay, sorry. So who our future spouse or our children's future spouse will be? So. Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, obviously God can reveal things to us, but to me, I'd be very cautious because anything like this, especially marriage, you know, people have free will, so God's not going to force somebody. And to me, where it can get dangerous is if somebody says, God told me that you're supposed to marry them, or God told me that I'm supposed to marry you, or God told me, and God's not ever going to give you a word that controls somebody else's behavior. You know, that's, that's more manipulation. So we may say, I believe that God's revealed this to me, um, and you can pray about that, but always remember, the other person has veto power. So if another person, if you say, I believe that you're my child's future spouse, and they say no, or I believe you're my future spouse, and they say no, then you were wrong, right? And so, so we can't see it as, I'm so sure God gave me this word that no matter what, I don't care what happens, what you do, whatever else, I know I have a word from God that you have to marry me. That's not godly. That's manipulation. So to me, that's why I say yes and no in the sense that I do believe God can speak to us and can tell us, tell us different things, but you have to be willing to be wrong because the person has the right to, um, to, to agree with that or not. It doesn't mean that they're even walking away from God. I, again, I'm cautious with this because um, I, I'm a minister at a Bible college. I meet lots of people and I've seen lots of situations where people just get it set in their minds, they're my future spouse. God told me they're my future spouse and they refuse to let go. It's like, you're wrong. They want nothing to do with you. They're not interested. Let it go. You're wrong. And they say, no, I have faith. And I, if, as long as I stand in faith, God will force them to marry me. And they're backslidden because they won't marry me. I don't think that's what you're asking about. I just feel like I need to say that to balance this out, is that we need to be careful when it comes to things like this that involve other people's will, other people's decision. I mean, imagine if I said, God told me you're supposed to give me a million dollars. And you're like, well, he didn't tell me that. that so prophecy I actually talked about how to receive a prophetic word um, in, a, in a previous lesson. Um, it should never be about controlling other people's behavior. Um, and it should never be a justification to tell people what they have to do. That's not how God speaks through us. He doesn't use us to control other people. He, um, so again, I believe what you're asking here is, does God reveal this to us so we can pray for people in advance and things like that? So I believe that it's possible in a sense, but approach that with humility and, um, uh, yeah, approach that with humility. Because uh, there's a good chance to, to be incorrect on that because it involves someone else's free will. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Um, Samaya on Facebook. When should you give a general prayer and when should you pray for a person by name? Sometimes the request list is so long it can become overwhelming. So what's the most effective prayer method um, when there are so many needs, requests, and things to pray for? It's a great question. I go more in depth on this one in the course on prayer. And basically, there's different ways to approach prayer. You know, to me, it's, it's easy to, to unintentionally just make a list of every single person in the world who needs prayer. Next thing you know, you have a list of 400 names. And you're like, well, I need to pray for them and them and them and them and them and them. And them. To me, that, that loses some of the effectiveness or some of the, um, the passion because to me, I prefer to pray. There's kind of two categories I approach this with. Some, I'll pray for these people no matter what every day, right? So my children, my wife, there's certain things or people I will pray for, and I'll say, Father, what do you want me to pray over them today? I'm going to pray for them no matter what. I'm asking you what to pray for them. So I'm approaching it. Again, I'm, in, I'm his ambassador, so I'm going to him as his ambassador saying, you put these people on my heart. These people are in my life. I'm, what would you like me to pray over them today? But then in other situations, I'll say, who else would you like me to pray for, and what would you like me to pray for them? Because if I just say, here's a massive list, I'm just going to pray for every single person. I pray for all the hungry people in the world. I pray for all the orphans in the world. I pray for all the, everything in the world. And we're just doing these massive, blanket, vague prayers. I'd much rather focus on what God's leading me to pray right now. 
so that it's being sparked by him and a desire from him. So that instead of saying like, here's all 500 things I can think of, because I guarantee that if we sat down and started making a list, we could come up with a thousand people to pray for, a thousand situations to pray for every single day. And we'd, we would just pray all day. To me, it's much more effective if we're, if we're being prompted by the Holy Spirit of this, okay, this person's on my heart. I'll pray for them right now. See, um, something that I used to do is I'd always think God would put someone on my heart and say, I'm going to pray for them later. I'm going to pray for them later and just go about my day. I'm going to pray for them later and I should pray for them later. And by the time later comes around, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's like 40 people I said I'd pray for later. So one thing that I started doing was just praying instantly. The minute God put somebody on my heart, I just pray for them right then, right there. Not usually just internally. Um, I don't have to go over that to them and lay hands on them or something. Many times it's just a stranger walking by and God put them on my heart because it doesn't have to be right? prayers not aren't effective because of our many words. You don't have to pray for two hours for it to be to be the real deal. It can be very quick when you look at the word. I mean, these prayers of Paul took me about 10 seconds to read them. You can pray a powerful prayer very quickly. It's about is this being sparked by the Holy Spirit? So if somebody's in my heart, instead of making this massive list of 200 people, that I pray for every day. It's just kind of the moment someone crosses my mind, I'll just pray instantly. Like I pray a blessing over them. I, you know, God, you know, whatever God puts in my heart, um, it may be very specific. It may be more vague. So like I said, there's some people that I'll pray for every day and ask God how to pray for them. But others with the mass list of generalities, I'll, I'll just, as it's prompted to me, uh, then I'll just approach it like that. Um, because again, to me, a very small percentage of prayer should really be intercession. To, from, my, from my experience and what I see in the Word and, and in my walk with God is that most prayer is fellowship with God, enjoying God, talking with Him, asking questions, just enjoying each other's company, letting Him choose topics to talk about, me choosing topics, you know, just more relationship side. And then, oh, and I pray for this person in this situation or, you know, God, what do you want me to do in that situation? Is there any way I can bless them? things like that, asking God for direction, things like that. Uh, to me, um, I don't see any examples in scripture of people approaching prayer the way that sometimes in the modern church we do, where we say, here's how to pray for an hour, pray for this for two minutes, this for two minutes, pray for global missions for three minutes, pray for orphans for two minutes, pray for widows for five minutes, pray for this and this massive list. I don't see that being prayer in scripture. Uh, that's just more of a modern thing of, of um, trying to cover all of our bases and just making it this really boring routine where it's like every day I have to do this. Well, why every day? Why not every 12 hours? Why not every, every week? Uh, to me, it's a bit too formulaic. So, uh, you know, I hope that helps. So again, I'd say both sometimes if, if they're on my heart by name, I'll pray for them by name. If it's a general category, then I'll pray for a general category. Um, for the most part, it's uh, as, as inspired as soon as the idea crosses my mind, if one day I'm like, I want to pray for all the orphans of the world and I'll pray for them right then and there. I won't just save it and say from now on, I'm going to pray for orphans every day. It's so vague. Um, and, uh, and it just becomes a long list. So I hope that helps. Again, I, I, I think I can cover it a bit more clearly and effectively in the full course where I can break it down a bit more, but that's my quick answer. Um, let's see here. So Ray on chat, aren't there times in the Bible when Jesus cast out demons? Am I misunderstanding something? Uh, no, that's, that's not what I'm referring to. So um, Jesus never wrestled demons. He commanded them to leave, right? So he didn't have a battle with the demons, a battle of the wills and them throwing lightning bolts at him, him throwing lightning bolts at them, him, I need more angels, they need more demons. You don't see this kind of spiritual warfare of like light versus darkness. It's like, no, he's got all authority. He casts them out to set the person free. What you don't see though, is you don't see Jesus hunting demons down. He doesn't go looking for the demons. If they manifested themselves, he commanded them to leave, but he focused on the people. So you never see Jesus being motivated by, I need to go to Jerusalem tomorrow because there's a big demon there I need to do war with. You don't see that kind of stuff. He focuses on people and people who come to him. And if they manifest a demon, he just get out of the way. Same with Paul, where once he had a young lady with demon possessed following him, and he didn't immediately say, I found one, I found the demon, quick, let's get rid of it. He ignored her until she just annoyed him so much he finally cast the demon out because she wasn't trying to be set free. She was just there to harass him. So if she'd come to him and said, I want to be free from this, he probably would have ministered to her immediately. But she was just annoying him. So she, he, he ignored her. He wasn't hunting demons. So to me, you don't see in, in New Testament ministry, you never see people hunting down, chasing the demons. I need to get rid of this demon. And then this person will believe they focused on the people 
and they dealt with the demons as they needed to, but they weren't looking for them. And it wasn't a battle. It was just complete authority. The only people you really see battling demons in the New Testament were the seven sons of Sceva or Siva, um, where they tried to say, in the name of, Paul, of Jesus, who Paul preaches, we command you to leave. And then the demon won that fight. <laughs> you know? And so that's not what we see um, us doing. It's about speaking the truth with boldness. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did, what Peter, what John, everybody did. Um, uh, to me, I don't see examples of going around trying to get demons to manifest because it's like, that's the secret. I need to go find this and get rid of it. Um, you just don't see that. You see people ministering the word. The word sets us free. If demons want to leave, they can leave. If they manifest, get rid of them, whatever. Um, demons have really good PR, but they're not that powerful. They're just about deception and, and um, getting people to be scared of them. So uh, anyway, I, I'm out of time. I got three seconds left. Two, one. Okay. I hope this has been helpful. I know we couldn't get to all the questions, but uh, uh, I'll see you all again in a few weeks, I think, and we can get to some more questions then. Pray that you, an that you have an amazing weekend. Enjoy Easter and uh, the Resurrection Sunday. And uh, anyway, have a great one. Have a good night. God has a purpose for every one of you. He doesn't enforce it and make you follow it, but I can guarantee you God has never planned for anybody to be a failure. Jesus has come to set us free. He's come to set you free from death on every level. He wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. He's not out to get you. He's out to bless you. There's gonna be words spoken throughout the next three days that are gonna be transformative and necessary for us to step into the call that the Lord has on our lives. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 